Shanna Galley. And I'm David Keener. And this is the Arlings Podcast Project. Tonight, the topic is writing horror stories. Uh, it's going to be interesting for me because this is the, one of the genres I have uh, very little experience. How about you guys? <laughs> Dave? I've got two whole stories that I think at least uh, partially count as horror. Uh, one of them is a fantasy crime horror mashup, and the other is a 101-word Halloween story called Foreclosure, which is free on my website if you choose to go there. What about you, Shay? I have uh, one young adult manuscript that is a horror mixed with romance, so it's actually a, a pretty cool uh, marriage. Uh, and that was one of the projects that was my 2022 goals, as you guys know. And that may be slipping, that may hand it in 2023, but it is a focal point uh, in the immediate future for my uh, my writing queue. So I'm interested in this topic because, you know, it's relevant for me right now. I'm working on a little horror. Yeah, for me, the current novel I'm working on is um, a vampire action adventure story. I kind of think that it's a little bit more action adventure than it is, um, you know, horror. So. Maybe that's where we should start this. Um, what what components are actually um, do you guys actually think are required for it to be categorized as a horror story? Does it have to have a monster? That's the first thing. No, I think it has to have fear uh, as a, a pervading mood uh, of the story. Um, yeah, I think I think tone and atmosphere yeah. are very, very, very important when it yeah. comes to a horror story. Yeah. Yep. Tone, mood, maybe some vivid imagery. I mean, you remember some of the scenes from the movie The Shining that just you you can't get them out of your head. They're so vivid. Yeah. And uh, when you think of like horror movies, what what are your favorites? So I like quieter horror movies, um, like, I don't know if you guys have seen The Witch. It's a really good, uh, mo very good Halloween movie um, about, like, a, a New England, a sleepy New England settler town that has a witch in the forest nearby. Um, and just, you know, nothing like, not, there's nothing being sawed off. No limbs are being sawed off. <laughs> nothing is super gory, but it's, uh, it's just very eerie and the, the slowness of it is almost an advantage of building what, you, what we were talking about, this atmosphere of, of increasing fear. Yeah, my, one of my favorite horror movies is the original Halloween. And the really interesting thing is that it was like the original stock and splatter horror film, but it only has like one drop of blood in the entire movie. Mm -hmm. And I find that to be very interesting because it really made everyone really, really scared and, uh, you know, full of fear. And they did it just by being incredibly creepy. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that's kind of, there's a bunch of different things about horror. Like you can go, you know, like supernatural horror you can go kind of creepy, slow moving, sneaking up on you, you know, the sense of dread horror, or yeah. you can go like super violent, bloody, et cetera, et cetera. They're all valid, but they're, they're all different types of, of horror. Yeah, I'll also add the one where they build the tension and then go, boom! <laughs> yes, that's and, true. Uh, uh, those are those are pretty good because they get my wife really good. I love going to those with or watching those with Brenda because she, mom, she squeaks really good. But, but and then also, there's, a, there's a there's a religious horror too, which I like a lot, like The Exorcist. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, um, well, what was that one about the creepy possessed nun? That was really scary. I think like, the thing about religious horror is, you know, sometimes it can get really wacky, and that's that's one thing, but. 
in the case of the exorcist you know that is apparently based on a true story and there are a lot of people whose faith believes in possession and believes in these things so the, the realer the closer that horror you know comes to reality i think the scarier it is yeah i, I think there's a whole tactic there to take the commonplace and turn it into something that, that you can fear. Right. Yeah. The, the, have you guys ever seen the uh, movie The Prophecy? No. Um, yes. With Christopher Walken? Um, you got to see it. It's so creepy, so scary. And uh, um, uh, it, was, it was really great. I won't do any spoilers, but it was... It was very, very uh, good horror movie. I also think that horror is interesting because, um, like, yes, you have a horror genre, but I feel like horror can be a like an overlay. It's something you can overlay on a bunch of other genres. Oh yeah, you can actually have any genre be a horror story. I mean. Right. There's a lot of really great horror science fiction uh, stories yeah. or, you know, westerns or yeah, my, romances. My example, right. My example is, is mixed with the romance. And uh, I've, I've never written a horror that's just horror that's not mingled with another genre. Uh, Dave, are your two stories mingled with another genre or are they just straight up? Uh, well, the 101 uh, word story um, is sort of like a jelly bean. It's it's got one idea and one one idea only, and then the, the, it drives it home with a with a big punch. So it doesn't have much room to be anything except a Halloween story. But the other one is fantasy, crime, and then the resolution turns out to be a horror situation. Um, and that was a lot of fun to write, but um, boy, that caused me a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah, I've even seen you know. Horror Christmas stories. <laughs> so. uh, there, there was one that was, a, I forget the name of it. It was a horror Christmas zombie musical. <laughs> Talk about math. Wow. I'm yeah. definitely going to have to put that one in the, in the notes. Yeah. So what are your common yeah. things that are in horror stories? I think that um, like fear of impending doom is a uh, big I think that um, the protagonist at some point ends up at the mercy of the monster. And I'm using monster, you know, uh, figuratively and not literally. Although monster movie horror is a thing too. Yeah. Um, I also think that um, well done horror stories can really touch on people's actual fears you know you know clowns or you know what's under your bed and, i think that's uh, where they drive some of their, i think that's where they derive some of their power is when they hit close to home and go oh oh what's in my closet yeah or, or and, when, uh, when came out, people didn't want to go to the beach it's really yeah. interesting how you can set tone and the atmosphere but just by your protagonist goes in a room, hits the light switch, and the light doesn't come on. I mean, click, what? Click, click, and where the flashlight starts getting dimmer. One thing uh, that I like to use in horror is uh, you know, not encountering the monster face to face right away, but you know, using sound, like hearing the monster outside the door, uh, and then he moves on, or, um, you know, uh, clues or hints that, that he's been here, but you're not really sure, you know, when he's coming next. Uh, not not just jumping right into it, but building up that, I guess like anything, you know, you do that with, with other genres too, like the slow burn of romance, where they're not going to kiss right away, you know, you got to work up to that. Same thing with horror. You got to work up to the, the terrifying woman. You got to build it up. With a with a lot of a lot of tension, I think. You gotta, I think you authors, gotta feel the suspense. You gotta feel the suspense, but I think authors are a little bit disadvantaged in the genre of horror as to filmmakers because I think that music and sound are very important uh, in horror and, and in film, and we we just can't do that as writers. So I do think that's, that's right. 
Well, um, well we, we have other tactics, though. So one thing I've noticed about horror is, um, you know, it's usually written in pretty close point of view, either first person or, or third person limited. So you're right there with the person as they're encountering things. Like uh, uh, doing multi-character, like omniscient um, writing. Hmm, I guess you could do it, but I don't think it's, it works real well with horror. You've got to be right there with the person going down the, the stairway into the dark basement. Yeah, the, you know, I, I would guess that the closest to a real horror story I've written, I've written some um, uh, zombie apocalypse stories. Um, but Wait, that are, counts. That, that definitely counts. Yeah, but with those, the horror part of it is more like the setting. Uh, the zombie apocalypse stories I do are more like action adventure and they, um, uh, I don't know how to describe it. I, I, don't, I don't see my horror story, my zombie apocalypse stories being like, though they have zombies and, uh, uh, stuff, but um, well, in, in your case, it could be more of a more of a survival story against the threat. Yeah, that's that that is entirely true. That is absolutely true. Yeah, it sort of depends on whether the zombies are like supernatural or non supernatural, mm -hmm. um, and, and really whether you're going for the the chills and thrills. But but even in a long running like zombie series, I feel like zombies they're not intelligent, so they lose their threat factor after a while. They're like a they're right. Like After you become force. competent in dealing with them and avoiding them, and uh, uh, then it's a pure survival situation. They might as well be bears, um, right? Or or rabid wolves, or you know whatever. Yeah. So that's always the challenge, with, especially with like long running zombie stories. Yeah. Once something becomes so familiar to an audience. How can it be as scary as it's intended to be? You know, you have to find a way to make it unique. Well, I, I, I think horror stories now, um, authors have a much bigger challenge because I think that the horror genre fans are a lot more jaded than they than they used to be. I mean, it used to, no. you know, a long, long time ago, you could have a horror movie with Frankenstein which today seems like really super mild manner. I remember right. talking to my mom. She saw it originally in the movie theater, and it scared her shitless. She couldn't sleep oh. after she saw it and stuff. And the same thing with Dracula, the original Dracula, when she saw that in the theater. See, I, I think some of those things have migrated. So zombies have moved into, sometimes, into survival stories, and vampires have moved into romance, romance. Stories, especially paranormal uh, suspense. Yeah. Yeah. Was that always? Wait, wait, Dave. Did that happen? I'm just saying. Of the some of those elements aren't as reliable. Huh? Did uh, did vampires moving into romance happen because of Twilight, or was there some of that before that book came out? There was a, there was some of that definitely before. before. Yeah. Like like the original Frank Langella vampire uh, movie. Um, that was that was definitely romance. Okay. Yeah. You know, and, and Anne Rice had some, you know, a fair amount of vampire yeah. romance and, and stuff. Um, Laurel K. Hamilton with uh, um, Anita Blake, uh, a vampire hunter and stuff. So Twilight was more like the, the YA um, instantiation yeah. of that uh, theme. So I might have mentioned this on this podcast before, but um, interesting fact, I have a friend who went to college to be a graphic design artist. And so it's a bunch of art, art classes. And she took one art class on um, like the, the theory of making monsters scary in art. And one of the things that she was taught that she told me that I thought was very interesting was that uh, to make a monster scary, you must have elements that look humanoid. So uh, just you know, a blob with a bunch of tentacles and eyes is typically not as bone chilling as like a black silhouette of a man with really long arms, you know, and no face. Like you can still kind of see it's humanoid, but something is twisted about it. And so I think that's also a very interesting element of horror is having humanoid touches, um, hu humanity being twisted 
you know, into something. Is it but, our own? But I will argue that that's not essential. Uh, two examples come to mind. One is Jaws, where they, the horror is from a man-eating shark. And I, don't the know, second you know, is, I don't know if I call Jaws a horror. Oh, it's definitely horror. I yeah, I would call that a horror. Movie. Yeah. And uh, the other is the Cthulhu mythos, um, where the, the, the threat are really like the, the elder gods who are so, so alien, they're almost indescribable. In, okay, in well, finding examples movie. of that not being the case doesn't mean it's not the case. Um, um, I, no, you've definitely hit a, upon a, a, a good trend. I'm oh just yeah, I can think it actually can be definitely scary. I mean, I I can think of examples of that. Um, Slender Man, you know, you've heard of Slender Man. Oh yeah, Absolutely. and uh, um, uh, you know, sometimes it's all it takes is a silhouette to turn around and like glowing eyes on him. That's enough for me, man. I, I think that she went even further, and I, uh, this part I don't remember as well, but she was saying that the class told her that it was it's something about like the human brain, you know, trying to recognize another human. Like, we're socialized to try to recognize other humans, like to, to survive and to, and to whatever. And so when, when our brain is trying to recognize it, and it has like a, wait a second, is that that's not, you know, at the, a moment that's what strikes the fear. It's something very psychological and primitive, which I, I find very fascinating. So maybe the, maybe the lesson here is to, when we're writing horror and coming up with horror stories, is to try to, to study a little bit of that, you know, those primitive drives in us um, that, that can be twisted or that can be betrayed uh, to become something very scary. Well, you can also, I think you can also, well, I agree with what you said, I think you can also try to evoke specific fears, yeah. whether it's fear of spiders or fear of heights, or another good one is the fear of enclosed spaces, which is why there's so many like you know you're hiding you're hiding from the serial killer in the closet type scenarios and stuff. Right. Yeah, creepy stuff. Um, it's it's really interesting to. Uh, 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 think about horror and how horror stories have actually changed a lot. Um, the splatter films now, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of movies and stories where okay, let's uh, let's come up with yet another way that we can horrifically murder this person um, and do it, you know, based on their worst fears. It's uh, it's actually a very interesting. Um, thing that's gone on with the genre. So, so one of my weirdest moments was I was at a convention on a panel um, with some horror writers, people who write more horror than I do, talking about the, the use of blood and gore in horror. And uh, you know, I like horror, but every single person that was on the panel with me was one of those gore fest type uh, writers. And it was a, it was an interesting, um, it, it was an interesting matchup because I was, they, they were not writing the kind of horror that I would usually want to read, and they didn't understand why the stuff I was proposing was like so, so mild and tame by their standards because I, I wasn't, uh, you know, promoting the chopping off of limbs and spurting blood and all of this other stuff that they find is essential for their stories. Well, you know, uh, chopping off limbs and decapitating people does not necessarily make it a horror story. You know, I've had a lot of decapitations in my, uh, you know, science fiction novels. Good point. Yes, um, because you have a death toll in your stories the way I do. Yeah, that's, that's true. It's true. And, uh, um, but, you know, I think a, a really good horror story um can uh just just scare you shitless as you're reading it and it's interesting how that happens because you're sitting here reading a book and if it's really scary how it actually makes you scared i lo I, I love that when it's done effectively yeah there's also something else i've noticed about horror stories more character driven than you might uh, really realize at first because 
you can't just kill off characters and have us have have the effect that you want. Yeah, like, you, you have, have to, to make care about. In them. fact, the best horror stories have the best character development. I agree. Because if you really want to scare your audience, you got to make them care about the people that are about to get slaughtered. And that's a really important part so that when it comes along and suddenly, you know, uh, Susie suddenly is standing there and her head falls over backwards, you know, no longer attached to her neck, you got to care about her first. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe that just happened. And, uh, yeah. And it usually happens just when they think they're finally safe, which is also a common uh, thing that happens in horror films all the time. I always uh, go, oh, she thinks she's safe. She's dead. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Never I, relax. I, I, Never I think relax. It's funny, writing horror, I think it's fun to like sort of play with people's expectations. You thought she was going to die, but she didn't. But then she died when you didn't expect it. That's like that's like Alfred Hitchcock, um, where the protagonist died halfway through the movie. Like, wait. Yeah, and Psycho. <laughs> That was, oh, yeah, that was that was psycho. Who you thought was the protagonist died. Yeah, and uh, before uh, the end of the first act, that right? really did break the mold for pacing of movies at the time. It in was the, very the, shocking for people in the shower. <laughs> no one ever took showers the same way again. That's right. And uh, well, and that that brings me to another thing, though pacing. Right, I think horror stories live or die by the, their pacing, and even in what we just described, it's like you may need to build up to that climax to to get where you to get the effect that, that you want. Right, you really do have to build it up, and you really do have to. Um, it, it is an art form to increase the tension and keep doing it, keep doing it, and having that psycho killer walking after her you know maybe letting off the tension periodically unexpectedly there were um, jaws is one of my favorite examples of you know horror especially when you see it on the big screen but yeah. then punctuated by by totally funny moments yep the next thing you know you know he's chumming the water oh my god we need a bigger boat yeah, when, when, Roy Scheider, when Roy Scheider and, and Jaws says, I th yeah, I think we're going to need a bigger boat, you're like, yeah, yeah, he's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting because uh, I, I really don't read that much horror either. Um, I like a good zombie apocalypse novel. That's as close as I usually get. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't even think of a... Uh, a good monster story that I have read. Um, that I uh, I've read a fair, a fair amount. Um, I've I've read most of Stephen King's stuff, for for example. Oh, okay, I've, Stephen I've King. Read, yeah, I've read a lot of Stephen King. I, yeah. I've read a fair amount of Dean Koontz. Um, there's a there's some other authors I I, I tend to read their horror books. Um, Dan Simmons, uh, for instance, has written some good ones, including uh, Carrie and Comfort, uh, which is like. The, the real truth behind vampires. Yeah, I guess that's true. I've read several vampire novels and stuff. That's always uh, that's always good. Oh, and, and Cthulhu and, stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, the book fourteen. I think that by Ernest Klein. Is yeah, that uh, Peter Klein. Peter Klein. Peter Klein. That was that was a Cthulhu kind of. Uh, story that I really enjoyed. That was horror. Well, there's there's more stories in that series. Yeah, I know. I've read them. Interesting stuff. Um, so what else you got? What other key components are in a horror movie? Horror book, you mean? Horror book. <laughs> horror story. Let's just call them stories. Well, there's, 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 there's tropes, you know, like there's the, the ancient curse. You know, from an ancient civilization that comes back, or um, there's the serial killer psychopath uh, thing going on, um, haunted house. Uh, I've seen a, a few more examples of like horror being mixed with um, 
like neo paganism and Wicca, and that kind of, I guess that would be sort of religious horror. So you got you got the religious genre, like we mentioned, the exorcisms, all that. Um, not, I mean, this is this is our Halloween episode. There's really not much like other than the movie Halloween that you were saying, Marty. Like I, I don't think I've ever read a story that was a, a genuine horror that took place on Halloween, besides Daniel Lee Curtis. I mean, well, how about you guys? Like, has, has Halloween really been integrated into the horror storytelling genre that much? Hmm. I'm sure it has. It's just uh, I haven't read a lot of Halloween horror stories. Yeah. But I, but, but I think that's more, more a, a personal failing, if you will, uh, Maybe, than the, yeah. the lack of. Um, I, I was going to mention that a lot of horror seems to depend on settings, like getting characters someplace different, whether it's a whether it's a hotel or a, a wax uh, museum or, or or a summer camp or uh, you an know, abandoned like insane asylum. True. Yeah. True. You know, getting them someplace else where they don't have their normal support infrastructure. Yeah. No and then stuff starts happening. No cell signal. I mean, a lot of books, not having cell signal is horror enough for some people. <laughs> oh, for me, it would be no internet. Or the, or the, don't, don't forget the, uh, the rich person's mansion, right? And yeah. riding you to the, with the gated entrance. Oh, yeah, the foundation is offering you a million dollars if you stay the night. Yes. In the Scarsdale house. <laughs> <laughs> well, next weekend, I'm going camping, uh. And uh, I always, I always, uh, you know, preface it with the guys that go with me that it's a horror movie waiting to happen because where half where we camp, there is absolutely no cell signal, total deadness, yeah, and no services, no electricity, and oh. um, only one way in and one way out. And and if you encounter the harbinger, then you should turn around. That that's the the guy or the crone or whatever that says, you're going to Sleepy Hollow. Why, did you hear about the kids that got killed there last year? Right, right, right. Are you sure you want to go, sir? He's at, he's at the gas station or he has a yeah. little lamp that he's holding. <laughs> so if you spot the harbinger, that's your clue. You're about to enter the horror scenario and you need to leave immediately. That's right. That's right. Which is another Halloween, uh, not Halloween, another horror trope. Yeah, fun stuff. Uh, yeah. Also, also, it's not like there's any horror stories associated with campers, right? <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah. I'm completely safe. Wait, wait. Especially going on Halloween weekend. See, if Ted Bundy lived nowadays, he would totally. If Ted Bunny lived nowadays, he would totally own the van life. Yeah. He, he traveled from town to town and picked up girls and, and, uh, and killed them and then disappeared. Oh, man. Made the mistake of getting caught in Florida. Where yeah, they what a guy. Time. What a guy. What a guy. That's uh, Silence of the Lambs kind of horror. Yes. What, what's it again? It's uh, Silence of the Lambs. Did a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, crime, crime over, uh, crime and the horror overlay. And fava beans. Well, and that's one thing. It's difficult in the book uh, to get the kind of performance that Anthony Hopkins uh, put in for that. And well, it did start as a novel, um, so. Uh, Yep, I, I own it. It's a good book. Cool. So what else you guys got? Are we done? What was it? Sound? Out. Uh -huh. <laughs> Dave, behind you. <laughs> oh, that's just my dog. Very scary. Yeah, and he's okay. He's a hellhound, but I've raised him since he was a puppy, so nothing bad could possibly happen. Well, yeah. I think my... My closing thought is that the greatest horror is an unfinished project, an unfinished book, right, Marty? That's the greatest horror. 
That's right. So it's uh scaring me really bad right now. Exactly. So all right, that's good for this week. We'll see you guys next week. Happy Halloween. Same bad channel. See ya. Don't be afraid. <laughs>